I want to give a high level overview of how everything is going to interact within the video that we are discussing today. It all begins inside of the terminal. And in the terminal, we utilize the Docker client with the Docker command. And there's a lot of things that we can do with this. We can run containers, stop them, create them. We can look at logs. We can ran really manage the entire life cycle of a container through the Docker client inside of the terminal. We're going to start talking about the image. And the image is nothing more than layers of software that are layered on top of each other. We have a base layer that could be something like Ubuntu, Node on top of that, and then our application code on top of that. And we call these layer one, layer two, layer three, the layers of our software that compose our final image that we use to deploy and create containers out of. Typically what we do with images is we pull them down. We pull them down from something known as a registry. And there are public and private registries. A very common public registry is the Docker Hub, and they house all of these images that we can pull down to our local machine. Inside of the registry is a bunch of things known as repositories, and each of these repositories hold all of the different versions of the images that we pull down. So we can have an Ubuntu repository, an Alpine, Node, Java, all these different repositories are holding all of the historical traces of images that have been put up to the public registry, and that is what we download them from. Typically, once we have the image actually on our host machine, what we can do is we can spawn a bunch of running instances of the image known as a container across different systems and servers all over the globe as many times as we want. And this automates the configuration and deployment of a given application very, very easily. I wanna talk about the comparisons of images and containers next to one another. An image is a unit of software which packages code and dependencies together to facilitate the deployment and reusability of the software that we are deploying. Every image that we build is going to have something known as the base image, and this could have a Linux distribution as the base image like Ubuntu. Let's say that we have a customer and they want to have the LAMP stack uh, basically pre-configured for their software. The LAMP stack is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. What we can do is we can just install this software within our image, and each piece of software is going to add another layer. And then the conglomeration of all these pieces of software installed together form our custom LAMP image. And and now we can use this to basically distribute amongst different developers across different servers and different deployments all over our environments. It's important to note that when we download these base images like Ubuntu, we are not downloading the entire operating system that you would see on a standard hypervisor. What we are doing is we are essentially installing a file system snapshot of the Ubuntu OS. This is a lot different. We don't have all of the standard device drivers that you would see in a full-blown installation. This is typical typically the bare bone minimum requirements that we need to get our application up and running. This is possible due to the fact that we use the host operating systems kernel. We can kind of split up the composition of an image into two pieces. On the left hand side, we have the file system snapshot, which is all of the dependencies and application code required to get our image running into a container. And on the right hand side, we have a start command, which is going to be the default command that executes the initialization and start up of the process within the container. Like I was just saying, we utilize the host kernel of the operating system to basically make all of this possible. When we create a container out of our image, we copy the file system snapshot into an almost micro partition on the host machine. We utilize control groups to essentially say, hey, this is how much RAM, CPU, network, etc., resources that you get for this process, and the kernel is going to kind of facilitate this communication. When we actually start the container, we run the process using the startup command on the host machine and that allows the container to run efficiently and effectively on the system. If we analyze containers and images metaphorically, we can look at a whole bunch of recipes that contain a bunch of ingredients, and this would be equivalent to an image. When we're talking about containers, we can think of a cake, such that you can have many cakes from a single recipe. Given a recipe, you can spawn almost identical copies of that cake, and you can distribute it to many different people. And that's kind of like how I think of containers and images as different entities. So first thing I want to do is talk about doc as a program. Once we've got Docker installed onto our system, we can type in Docker 
and it will show us a whole variety of commands that we can use. We're only going to be talking about a few of these in today's video, uh, but we will be talking about more of them in future videos. The first one I want to talk about is the docker run command. Docker run allows you to run a command inside of a new container. From our previous discussion, we know that for a container to be ran, they get ran from an image. If we type in docker images, we see that we don't actually have any images installed. And this is where we need to download them. In order to download images, you can go to the Docker Hub. So the Docker Hub is a really good place to get images and you can find a whole variety of different images, things like Mongo, Postgres, Redis, Nginx, Ubuntu, etc. But also we can search for them directly in the terminal. We can run a Docker search and type in uh, for example, Alpine, which is a, a lightweight Linux distribution. And we can see this is the official image. It's highly popular and it looks like this is one of the images that we want. So we can do a Docker pull Alpine and it will actually download this onto our host machine. So now if we do a Docker images, we can see that we have the Alpine image now available on our machine. This gets really interesting because now we have a container. We can create containers out of this, or we have an image. We can create containers out of this image so I can do something like docker run I can specify the image name and then I can specify a command that I want to run so I can say echo this is the simple engineer once I hit okay we know that echo will just uh, pipe the input to standard out and we can see that it ran the command inside of the container and then it kind of exited so what just happened well what just happened is it ran the command it ran the process that we told it to run and then the container stopped and it exited so if we do a docker ps this will show all of the running containers if we do a docker ps dash dash all or dash a it'll show all of the containers that we have ran that are not currently running so we can see that this container specifically it was created 30 seconds ago but then it exited and why did it exit well the reason it exited is because the startup command of this container is echo this is the simple engineer so it runs that process and once it says hey i ran this process then I'm going to exit. So I can restart the container. I can copy this hash of the container ID and I can say docker start, pass in the container ID. And now you see we don't actually get the message anymore. But if I do a docker ps, you see that it exited seven seconds ago. And it actually did execute the command again. It's just that I need to attach myself to the container when I do it. So in order to do that, I can say docker start dash a, paste in the container ID again, and now it pipes it out again. And this allows us to attach standard out to our terminal, and now we can see the output. You may be asking, this doesn't seem very useful because I wanna be able to log into that container. Logging into the container brings us to another flag known as dash it. So if we actually run docker run and then we pass in the IT flag, this allows us to essentially say we are attaching an interactive terminal to the container that we are about to run from this image. To understand this a little bit better, we know that um, in Linux, a process has three communication channels. We have standard in, we have standard out, and we have standard air. What this is allowing us to do is essentially say, I want to attach to standard in of the container. So I wanna be able to send commands to the container and then I want to be able to get the standard out of that output written to my shell. So this gives us this kind of interaction between the terminal. So if I run docker run IT, I pass in the container, the image name, and then I can pass it the process that I wanna run. So let's say I want it to run the shell process. If I hit enter, I've now entered the shell of the container. So I can run ls-la, we can see the different file system snapshot of this particular image. Um, and then I can obviously create directories um, and then I can exit. If I do a docker ps, we see that the container is not running anymore because we have exited it. But if I do a ps dash dash all, uh, we see that the startup command is now this shell. So what I can do is I can do a docker start on this container ID. And now when I do a docker ps, we see that it is actually running in the background. Now that I have this running in the background, if I wanted to actually execute commands into this, we use a, a command known as docker exec. So I can say docker exec, and then I can do dash IT. So I'm feeding in standard input into this container, and then I'm gonna pass in the container ID, and then the command I wanna run. So this is the simple 
engineer. And we see that it executes that command. The container is still gonna be running, um, but now if I want to actually log into it again and get a, a shell, all you have to do is do docker exec dash IT. You can paste in the hash of the container and then you can just do a sh and that's gonna be the shell. And now you see I'm back inside of the container. Uh, let's talk about interacting with containers um, from some different commands. So if, if we do a docker ps, um, we see that we have this container ID. If I wanna stop this, I simply just do a docker stop on the container ID and it will stop the container. It's important to note that it seems like it's taking a long time and that's because docker stop tries to gracefully shut down the container. And that basically says, hey, I'm gonna give the running processes within the container a chance to stop. And if they can't gracefully be shut down within 10 seconds, then I'm going to force a kill. If you want to instantly kill a container, you can just do a docker kill and then paste in the hash. Obviously it's not running anymore, but that's exactly what we would type to achieve that. Okay, so I can do a docker ps, which will list all running containers. A docker ps-a or a docker ps-all will list all the past containers that have ran, but are in an inactive or exited state. So if you want to stop these, or start these, you can do a docker start like we saw previously, and that will actually start the container. And if I want to create a new container from an image, what we can do is go back to docker images, and I can actually do a docker create, and I can do a docker create alpine, and it will create an image for me, and it'll just give in the hash. So going back into docker ps-a, we see that it was just created. We haven't ran it yet. Um, this is the startup command that we had given it by default, and we can alternatively run this container as we please. You'll notice in the right-hand side, we actually get a bunch of random names in this far right column. We can assign our own names if we'd like, and in order to do that, when you create your container from an image, you can do uh, docker run dash dash name alpine, uh, Actually, we'll do the simple engineer and then the image name. If I look at my Docker PS-A, you'll see now we have the simple engineer as the name and this is using the Alpine image. The difference between some of these commands like Docker run, Docker create, and Docker start if we look at Docker run in a little bit more detail, uh, Docker run will actually go out and go to the Docker hub, the Docker registry, and attempt to pull the container in if it doesn't exist. It'll create the container out of the image uh, that you pull down from the Docker hub, and then it will run it. So it's a very all-inclusive command. If we do something like Docker run Ubuntu, it'll say that it can't find it, so it'll start pulling the Ubuntu image from the third-party registry and download it onto my computer. What it'll do is it'll then execute the default process. So if we do a docker ps-a, you can see that it actually ran the Ubuntu image into this new container and gave it a new name. Docker run will do a lot more. If we do something like docker create Ubuntu, it'll just create a container out of it. So if I do something like docker create node, it'll also pull in the image from the third party registry and it will just create this container. It will not run it by default. And that's kind of the difference. So docker create, docker start, and docker run are all very useful commands that allow you to manage the initial life cycle of a container. All right, guys, so that pretty much does it for a very uh, basic introduction to some of the useful commands that you would use with the Docker client. In the next video, we'll be diving a little bit deeper and looking into things like Docker files. We'll talk about Docker Compose and actually creating custom images in a more advanced way. So thank you guys for watching. If you have questions, feel free to leave a comment and subscribe, and you can check out out some articles on thesimpleengineer.com for Docker related articles and tips and tricks for your Docker workflow. Thank you guys and have a good day.